challenges with all of those modern communications methods, and that is that every single one of them is reliant on infrastructure. And some of that infrastructure is uh, simple and some of it is very complex. But as you know, every piece of infrastructure has one or more, possibly many more, potential points of failure. And so they all require some attention. So, you know, there's a couple ways to remedy that, those challenges that are infrastructure related. One way is to minimize the infrastructure, and that way you can minimize the potential points of failure. However, we hope in an emergency situation not to have to resort to this. So we've got a number of amateur radio tools, many of which you guys are gonna be familiar with. Obviously we've got voice, we've got CW, and lots of other digital modes. Some of you probably play with PSK, maybe you've played with Olivia, and of course there are many others. I'm not gonna go into all those tonight because that's not the focus of tonight's presentation. Um, the important thing about emergency communications is choosing the right tool for the job at hand. And so a lot of what we would do, uh, you know, we have choices of VHF, UHF, we've got repeaters and we've got HF depending on, you know, terrain and distances that we're trying to cover. And of course the mode is an important thing. Um, we find that voice is the best for tactical communications and by tactical communications, I would say something like uh, KK4JP, this is KW6GB, uh, Net control needs you to move to the, the location at the south side of that bridge and report the conditions from there. So that'd be a typical tactical communication. Um, CW is especially good if you want to uh, make very efficient use of the radio spectrum. Uh, of course, these days with so many other people that haven't bothered to uh, learn anything about CW, it's almost secret code, but you get the idea, especially if you're a CW operator. It's, it's an excellent mode. It's far from dead, in my opinion. Um, other digital modes are even like, even like CW. They're really the best for logistical communications. And when I say logistical communications, I'm talking about, say, a list of residents at a shelter or a list of supplies needed at that shelter, whether those supplies may be bedding or meals or cases of water, those kinds of things. Uh, a lot of times they involve lists that would be very tedious and error prone to pass using voice. So that's why digital is better than voice for logistical communications. And of course, uh, that kind of stuff is beyond just using digital communications to transmit radiograms, although we do that. Um, your choices also include whether you use a mode that includes error correction. I know some of the common digital modes have error correction, but others do not. For example, PSK, um, you get what you get, and a lot of times you can read what comes up on your screen and figure out the, the gist of the message just based on the context. But there are times when error correction would be critical because you can't be relying on figuring out what, it, what the sender intended. Um, there's also uh, questions as to whether you need to have a synchronous or asynchronous communication. Synchronous being both the sender and the receiver are on the air at the same time. And asynchronous meaning I can send you a message and you might pick it up an hour later. So you don't necessarily need access to the radio at the same time that I have it. And of course, you also need to determine whether your message is best sent from one person to a whole group. Uh, I think my presentation tonight would qualify as a one-to-many type communication. And there are other communications that might be best done one-to-one. -one. And so based on all those things that you need to communicate, you'll want to choose the best mode for that type of, of task that you're trying to undertake. So tonight I'm here to tell you a little bit about one of those, and that is WinLink. And just as it says on their logo, it is a global radio email system. Um, I'm probably Virginia's biggest cheerleader for, for WinLink, but I am careful to note that it's, I don't consider it to be a silver bullet, um, and it's not the solution to everything. Again, in the previous slide, I talked about choosing the right tool for the right job. There's a lot of, to, there's a lot of jobs for which I believe WinLink is the appropriate tool, but not every job, obviously not for tactical communications. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those issues. Uh, so in spite of the fact that it isn't a, uh, the be all end all, it does have numerous advantages. So let's look quickly at WinLink's basic features. First of all, it has a familiar interface. It transmits all messages error free. It has built in forms for served agencies and it can use the internet to one degree or another or not. And it can facilitate bi-directional communication with non-amateurs. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So we're gonna look at all of these features and in not too much detail, but give you a quick overview of each one of them. First of all, WinLink's familiar interface. If you're a user of a program like Outlook or uh, back in the day, I used to use an email program called Eudora. Um, this is the WinLink main screen. And you can see that in the largest part in the center there is the, the list of messages. Below the list of messages is a message preview screen, which you might use if you have Outlook set up on your computer. At the left-hand side, there are system folders. Below that, there are some personal folders that are my choices. The system folders are built in, and I've created the personal folders myself. And uh, global folders is for when you have multiple users on a given WinLink uh, installation, that those folders could be available to every user, whereas the personal folders are tied to a particular user. And of course, down at the bottom left, you'll see contacts. I don't make big use of my contact list because of the way that I use WinLink, but it's there if you need it. It can be just like your Outlook address book. Up at the top of the screen, just below the title bar, the green title bar, you'll see it has the typical Windows configuration of a menu and at the top it's it's a text menu where you can choose a variety of options of uh, things you want to do and right below that is a button menu with icons that are kind of shortcuts to starting some of those uh, tasks that you would normally do. Creating a message in WinLink is very much like creating a message say in Outlook so when you uh, click on the start a new message link in that opening screen you get a pop-up window that looks very much like this. And all you need to do is fill out the two fields, the uh, carbon copy field if you want. Notice there is no blind co a carbon copy field because amateur communications are required to be open. And a subject line, and then below all that is the uh, uh, message body where you type your message. Now, what you might notice is, this is where this gets different than say something like Outlook. I've got this message all composed, but there's no send button like you would see at the top left of your Outlook message screen. And that's because there's a lot of choices for how you want to send your message. So if you look up here at the top, WinLink wants to know how you want to send that message. If you want to send it as a WinLink message, as a radio only message or a peer to peer message. And that's important because WinLink handles each of those a little bit differently. I'm not going to go too deeply into it, but it's just another step you have to take and that's a, one of the reasons that there is no send button from the message itself. So once you have selected the message, the way you want to send that message, then you would post the message to the outbox. That's the, going to be the closest thing to a send button on this screen you're going to have. And after we get to the outbox, we'll take a look and, and see what our options are after that. So it's important to know how the WinLink system is set up. So we as users are there at the bottom of that graphic. So I'm, I'm there at the left, you know, your, your, your call sign can substitute in any of those others at the bottom. Uh, we're gonna ignore the one on the bottom right, the computer telnet for the moment. But what happens is um, when we send a message using WinLink, it leaves our station down at the bottom and it ends up RF in the atmosphere, whether it's HF, VHF or UHF. And we typically would send to what we call a gateway. Some people call them nodes. This is a, a gateway in your general area, which unfortunately due to construction is not currently operational, but it's just an example of a VHF gateway that's available to send a message. So if you wanna send a message to anywhere in the world and you have access, uh, line of sight, or I should say RF access, to, to a VHF gateway, uh, then that message can go from your station via RF to that gateway. 
That gateway will, will then automatically connect to the internet into a specific portion of the internet called the common message server or CW, sorry, CMS, and that's part of the WinLink system. And it used to be five servers spread around the world, but it's now part of the Amazon Web Services cloud, but it does have redundant backups. The message then will sit on that common message server until, so if I send that message to John Porter, for example, it will sit here on this common message server and wait for John to connect via RF to some gateway somewhere. And that gateway will then pull through the internet to the common message server and download that message and then transmit it via RF to John's station. It's just that simple. There, you, met, you saw earlier, I mentioned there was a peer-to-peer -peer mode. And in peer-to-peer -peer mode, we can basically get rid of all outside infrastructure. So if I wanna send a peer-to-peer -peer message to John Porter, we can just imagine his call sign KK4JP here. I compose the message. I start a peer-to-peer -peer session. This is one of those instances where the recipient has to be on the air at the same time as me. I send that, I begin transmitting that message. It goes out RF in the atmosphere directly to John's station. And he has it as soon as my uh, computer and radio are done sending it. So it, it, it eliminates all of this other infrastructure that has the potential to have faults on it. So yes, I can have a fault at my end, John can have a fault at his end, but it's many fewer fault opportunities than when we use the, the uh, larger portion of the system. Greg, how would it get to Larry Iker who might not have his Windley set up yet? Well, I am gonna to touch on that a little bit later, but I did send him a message today and I'm gonna guess that he probably received it. In fact, the sample message that I showed a few slides ago was addressed to Larry at his regular email address, and I had uh, carbon copied John on that. I did get it. So, very good. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll touch more on that in a little bit. So, I mentioned that once you have the message in the outbox, and that's what we're looking at now, this is the WinLink main screen, but we're actually looking at the outbox the outbox is telling me that I have one message waiting in it. It's this message that I composed earlier today, and it's addressed to Larry with a carbon copy to John. And so at this point, I have to choose what uh, session type I'm going to use to send that message. In this case, um, there's this pull down menu that when you click on this button here, it drops this entire menu down. And these are most, and they won't all fit on one screen, but these are most of the modes or the session types that WinLink will allow me to use. I believe in this particular case, I did choose packet WinLink. And that's how I sent the message to Larry and John. Once you have chosen that mode and you've started that session type, then, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Once I selected packet WinLink, then I would open the session by clicking on the words open session. And then I get a little pop-up window that is the session itself. And in that window, I get to choose which gateway I'm gonna send it through. If I happen to know the call sign and SSID of that station, I can just type it in, tune my radio to the appropriate frequency. And if I don't know, I can click on this button that says channel selection, and I'll get a pop-up that tells me all of the gateways uh, within, I think, uh, 150 kilometers of me, something like that. And so once I do that, I would then uh, click on the start button here on that session window. And we start to see some of the text that tells me the progress of the session. Um, this tells me, this identifies me this identifies the version of WinLink I was using when I sent that message. This is the serial number or message ID number of the message I am sending. And since the station that I connected to uh, connected via internet to the common message server, it looked at that server and saw that there were several messages waiting for me. And that's what you see right here. And so 
after I connected, it recognized that I had a message to go out. It tells me that I have three messages to, to receive. And then it proceeds to sending the message that I have to go out. You'll see this serial number is the same as this serial number. Now you'll also see this green bar. It's a progress bar for the transmission of a message. And in this case, it's barely started. It'll progress all the way across the screen. And when it's finished, the message has completed sending. When it, later in the session, when I download these messages, there'll be a green progress bar that works its way from right to left. And that's, at that, that's what that screen looks like. Now, I mentioned that it was error-free. WinLink, with WinLink, you're either going to get all of it or you're going to get none of it. Um, it does a, um, an ARQ uh, repeat request. And so it makes sure that what is sent is exactly what was received. Vice versa, I guess. What was received was exactly what was sent. If for some reason there's, there's some sort of interference from another station or there's atmospheric problems, then you won't get the message and you'll get a disconnect. So it's an all or nothing proposition. Now, in my opinion, WinLink has a number of big advantages, but I'll just talk about three of them here. I don't expect you to be able to read this form, but this is a, um, an image of a paper ICS-213. If you're not familiar with what an ICS-213 is, in the realm of emergency management, it's one of the most commonly used forms out there. It is a general message form, and you would address it from, for example, my emergency operations center to the, Vir the uh, Virginia Department of Emergency Management Emergency Operations Center in Richmond. And, um, you know, it's got an incident name so we can track it. It's, it's got a two two field where I would not send it to an individual, I would send it to a position. You don't want to send these kind of forms to an individual because if they go off shift, it, the message might sit there undelivered. And, you know, like most messages, it has a subject, a date, and a time, and then the message itself is here in the middle of the form. The paper message does provide for a, an area to reply. And so that's, that's a commonly used form. Now, WinLink so the advantage that WinLink has is it can, it can use attachments. And you could attach this paper form. This particular one was a Microsoft Word document. The unfortunate thing is it's a 74 kilobyte attachment, and that's the one that you're actually looking at right there. Uh, if you've done any digital work, you, you know that you probably want to shy away from sending a 74 kilobyte attachment. In fact, within the WinLink system, um, they have a 120 kilobyte message plus attachment limit, so you don't tie up resources forever. So, of course, another option would be to convert this to a PDF document. Unfortunately, that means it's a 107 kilobyte attachment. The advantage to PDF is if somebody doesn't have Microsoft Word, they can still get it. The disadvantage is it's even bigger. So, where we get the WinLink advantage is built into WinLink there are a large number of forms ready to be used. And they, when you select them, they pop up on screen in, as an HTML, like a web page, ready to be filled in. So what you're looking at here is the WinLink native ICS-213 form, and it has all of the same information, actually the exact same information that I put on that paper form that you saw a moment ago. And I, in the image here, I truncated the reply section down at the bottom, but it's there. But the nice thing about this particular message is it's an HTML attachment and including the message that, that is carrying it, it's only 1.2 kilobytes. So that's why I say this is one of WinLink's big advantages. The second big WinLink advantage, and I mentioned it earlier, was the use of the internet or not. An RMS means radio message server or yeah, remote message server. Uh, it's another term for a gateway. So if I send a WinLink message out through a gateway, it transfers, it goes from me to the gateway, to the internet, to the gateway that the end user uh, selects. That's that asynchronous communication that I described earlier. If we choose, instead of sending it as a WinLink message, if we send it as a peer-to-peer -peer message, then it's directly end user to end user, and that's the synchronous communication. So again, in the RMS transfer, we do use the internet. In a peer-to-peer -peer 
transfer, we do not use the internet. The third big advantage, and this is the really big one for me, is it allows bi-directional communication with non-hams. So when the question was asked of me about sending a WinLink message to somebody uh, like Larry, who maybe doesn't have WinLink set up, WinLink allows me to send an email to any standard email address in the world. So I was able to send that message to Larry. If I had to send a message to the governor's office and I had a legitimate email address, but he had no amateur radio operator there, no problem, I can just send the message and the, the intended recipient can get it. So I can send something to the, the Virginia Department of Emergency Management radio room when it's unmanned because I have the secret email address to send something to there and I can still use WinLink to do that. Which, by the way, my local emergency manager is rather pleased about that because we've got this little pile of rocks called the Blue Ridge Mountains that separate us here in the Shenandoah Valley from VDEM in Richmond. And that's a concern to my emergency manager that some disaster might prevent us from having direct access to them. But I can still get the message through, whether it's VHF or HF. So I mentioned sending it to the governor's office, but um, you know, the end user, when if the governor's office receives my message, they're allowed to reply and they just send it through their regular uh, email system and it'll, it'll be addressed, the reply would be addressed to my WinLink address, which is my call sign at winlink.org. And so that end user sends it through the internet the internet knows to direct it to the common message server in the WinLink system, and it sits there waiting for me as the end user of the re or the recipient of that reply. So you could use it to send, you know, safe and well information to family out of state. If you had somebody at a shelter and they were trying to, you know, we had no, no standard communications out of the area and wanted to send a message to my parents in Oklahoma saying that Greg and his family were fine, easy to do. The nice thing about it is, there's no violation of part 97 when the governor's office replies to me. And that's because nobody is sending anything over RF except a licensed amateur. So that's a big advantage. Uh, you know, some of the other digital modes, not only do you have to have an amateur there at the same time as you're on the air to receive that message, but it's got to be, to an, it's only amateur to amateur. That's a big advantage in my book. All right. So, Maybe I've convinced you that you do need it to use WinLink. So what kind of stuff do you need in order to make it operational? Well, hardware and software requirements include the program WinLink Express. I say that it's free mostly because it's a free download. It's free to use. They're run by volunteers. So we've got volunteer programmers, uh, people maintaining the system, even everybody that operates a, a, a local gateway is doing so volunteer. So the WinLink uh, development team asks that if you can uh, to help offset the costs of maintaining all the hardware necessary to make this work. And so to do that, if you don't register and pay the $24 fee that WinLink uh, asks of you, you'll get a little, we call it nagware. It's, it's not in your face. It's a pop-up that comes up when you start the program and after about five seconds, you can click on a button that says, remind me later. Obviously, I've paid my fee, so I don't get to see that little nagware pop-up, but I make a significant use of, of WinLink. I, I send and receive more than 900 WinLink messages a month. You also need a computer. Uh, Windows 10 is the requirement. Obviously, if you're a Mac user, you can use a Windows emulator and it'll work just fine. You need some sort of interface to go between your computer and your radio, sometimes with some of the newer radios like an ICOM IC7300 and others. They'll have built-in interface because they have sound cards built into them. Um, some, of, some of the folks using old school packet technology might have a, an old Cantronics uh, TNC rolling around in their um, bins under their, in their shack. Um, other option would be to use a Signalink, which is an external sound card. And there are numerous others. There's an, there's an Easy Digi and there's a new one called the DRA30, I believe it's called. Anyway, some sort of interface between the computer and the radio to get your messages ready to go.
optional hardware if you want the really highest speeds available then you might want to tell Santa you're looking for a Pactor modem. I have to tell you if I went out and bought a Pactor modem that it would be the single most expensive piece of hardware in my shack. However, there's a software alternative and that's a, a new protocol devised by a, an amateur in Spain who's done a really excellent job. And it's a sound card mode, so my signal link works just fine with it. And it is so fast, it's faster than almost all of the non-packed or modes that are already built into WinLink. And it's so fast that I've, I've begun calling it poor man's packed or. Because everybody's got a different computer with different pieces of software on it, a different radio, a different interface. There's way too many configuration variables for us to go into tonight. Any one of them could take up more than the time we have in this meeting. So I always recommend that if people want to get good help on, on configuring their system, they want to sign up for the two Google groups that are uh, owned and operated by the WinLink development team. And the one called WinLink Programs Group is the one devoted mostly to helping people configure and get it to work right on their system. The WinLink for MCOM system is really specific to dealing with emergency communications issues. Uh, I can tell you there's a huge um, uh, collection of very experienced users in the WinLink programs group. And if you were to have a problem and you were to sign up and sign on and pose your question, chances are really good that at least one person has already faced and solved the problem that you're facing. And so I find that well-worded questions usually get numerous answers within the next 30 minutes. So it's a responsive group all around the world. So I always encourage people to take advantage of it. And of course, you got other experienced users locally. So obviously I'm gonna make, not make fun of, but I'm gonna put John Porter on the, on the spot here and tell you that he'd probably be glad to help you get going. But you know, our hobby's all about Elmer's. So that's, that's a good place to go. And if you stump John or you stump me, then you go to the WinLink programs group and ask your question and get a real answer. All right, so now what? Well, my recommendation is you use WinLink on a regular basis because when I moved here to Virginia after I retired in 2014, I found that some local guys were using WinLink, but they weren't using it on a regular basis. And because they weren't using it on a regular basis, they would forget some of those steps. Like I said earlier, there's no send button on the message composition window. So if you use WinLink on a regular basis, those things will all become secondhand and you won't be stumbling over yourself to be sending a message, which we don't want to do if we're called to serve, you know, a local emergency management agency. We want to be competent and confident that we can get the job done for them in a timely manner. Obviously, if you're if you start using WinLink and you become good at it, be an Elmer in, you know, in the in the best in the best traditions of our hobby, be an Elber and help Elmer and help somebody else get up to speed. And of course, I have to plug my own little thing. You have to, there's an opportunity to join WinLink Wednesday, which is my every Wednesday net asking for check-ins from around the state uh, using the WinLink system. Uh, just to give you a sense of who participates, this is a map from last week's net. There are 135 stations within Virginia that are plotted on that map. And that doesn't even show, uh, there's another view that would, but that doesn't even show the three dozen check-ins that I received from out of state, you know, like our friend there, BFB in North Carolina. Uh, but I also get check-ins from California, from Idaho, from Washington, New Mexico, Texas. Uh, I've got a regular user who checks in every week from Sierra Leone in Africa. So the word's getting out. Um, WinLink has grown a bit since I started it in, in August of 2016. So after one full year, I'd received uh, 2,970 messages. And I'm not going to read all this data to you, but you can see that uh, the traffic through my station for WinLink Wednesday has grown each year. And so we're really pleased that more people are using WinLink and we're building a cadre of competent, confident users. And that's my presentation. If you want to know more, uh, I have a web page, winlinkwednesday.net. 
And that's, uh, that's where all the information about the weekly net is posted, uh, some general training stuff, other information that's uh, a potential use to you. If you're a Facebook user, you can certainly join Virginia MCOM, uh, which we also post the information about the net and its results at that location. And you can always reach out to me at my email address, saferCitizen at gmail.com. But that's my presentation, so if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer. How do you run the net? I mean, do you, for some reason, my mind kept thinking WinLink is only sending messages, but is there a free format where people, I know about eight or 10 just from our club check in regularly. So I think, I think of WinLink as just like sending a regular email. So the net runs 24 hours on Wednesdays. So from, you know, tomorrow morning, you know, one minute after midnight, you can send me a WinLink message and you'll be on my roster for this week, all the way up until 2359 on what Virginia calls Wednesday, not UTC, but Virginia. Um, so you would send a message. Those kinds of messages would typically be the message you would send through a gateway. And so they sit on the CMS, the, com the uh, common message server, and periodically through the day, I log into a, a gateway and pull down messages. So I might pull down six messages. I might pull 20. I might pull 50, to give, depending on the time of day. And those all just get dumped into my roster. Then at two times during the day, once in the morning from 7.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. And again in the evening from 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m., I host what we call peer-to-peer -peer sessions. And in those peer-to-peer -peer sessions, which are run on AHF, I do them on 80 meters. I sit here in front of my computer with my radio on, and I invite people to send a peer-to-peer -peer message to me. And I'm, we, they know what type of session to be in. And so I just sit here and receive their messages and copy and paste their data, their check-in data. And then on Thursdays, I produce that roster and, and uh, post it on the web and let people know that it's available. I also post the results on the Virginia MCOM page. Does that make sense? A can for BFB also is a question. So for some of us out there, we've got a win link set up and we're sending emails and we've kind of settled into a routine. Would you recommend the, uh, the Facebook group as a place for tutorials? Maybe I want to try different modes or, um, you know, maybe I want to go out and, and buy a pack door modem and have a tutorial or a walkthrough or something like that, that may not necessarily warrant a specific question uh, more than guidance. So where would you direct somebody for something like that? So, um, yeah, for the interaction part and coordinating something like that, you know, if, if you're not one of those uh, Facebook haters, I would recommend the Facebook group because you can always post a message there saying, hey, I'm, I just bought a packed door modem and I'm wanting to practice with somebody who can help me out. And, and uh, somebody will probably jump up. There's not a ton of packed door users uh, here in Virginia, at least as part of my net. There's a, a gentleman in the south portion of the state, Randy, KE4RL, and he runs a pack door peer-to-peer -peer subnet all day every Wednesday. And unfortunately for him, he usually has only three or four check-ins via pack door. I used to, I used to be able to check in using pack door uh, from our local EOC and from our local hospital. Access to the hospital is a little challenging lately. But I have found uh, Randy, KE4RL, he participates in the Virginia MCOM Facebook page. And if you were to direct message him or even just post the question on the page, I'm sure he would arrange a time to have a peer-to-peer -peer session just for you to play. And you guys could use Messenger to communicate back and forth and say what's working or what's not. That help? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Great. Okay, uh, we've also got some uh, some comments there. Uh, uh, Dennis wants to know about security issues and attachment limitations, I guess, apart from that, uh, that size limit. Uh, so uh, Dennis, do you wanna ask him that question directly or, or did I ask it for you? Uh, you did a good job there, John, thank you. 
So, can you hear me? Well, let me address the security piece. Yeah, Dennis, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the size limit applies to any message that you send through the uh, the portion of the WinLink system that involves the internet. Uh, so if you had something that, you know, you had several attachments and they all, ex and the combination of them exceed that limitation, then I would just multiple messages. Um, I haven't actually tested to see if that size limitation applies to a peer-to-peer -peer message. But trust me, on HF, you probably don't want to sit around long enough to send a 120 kilobyte attachment. Um, so, you know, attachments are good. Try to keep them small. Be kind to the, uh, the other people who want to use the infrastructure. And then as far as security, uh, like all amateur communications, in, encrypting is not permitted. So um, there have been some people who have complained to the FCC that when link messages are quote unquote effectively encrypted, uh, that's not actually true. Uh, it, they're they're making that complaint because they're they're too lazy to put forth the effort uh, to decompress the messages. But certainly one guy uh, has demonstrated that it's not very difficult to uh, receive the messages over the air and decrypt them nearly on the fly. And so, of course, when we're doing communications either for a hospital or for local emergency management, we're always cautious to tell them. None of what we send can be encrypted. So, you know, people always ask the question about, well, what about uh, HIPAA violations? Uh, of course, the HIPAA regulations apply to care providers. They don't actually apply to amateur radio operators because we're not providing care. So we just remind people at hospitals that we can't encrypt. And if they're wanting us to send personally identifiable health information, we, we bring that to their attention, but our job as communicators is to send what they tell us to send. So if they insist that I send out, you know, your name, birth date, and address over the air, I'm going to follow their instruction, and amateurs are not held accountable for that. But again, no encryption, so it's all potentially visible to the public. Okay. Uh, thank you. Great, great presentation, by the way. Yeah. Uh, thank great, you. Uh, let's see, uh, I'm not seeing any other hands up here, so I'll ask you a, a good one. Uh, the fact that uh, WinLink is hooked up to the rest of the internet, I'm constantly getting spam emails on the rest of the internet. Why don't I get any spam emails on my WinLink? <laughs> well, that's, that is a good question. Um, because they've got a really good system for blocking most of that stuff. So, for example, if if Larry had sent me an email to my WinLink account, um, and if he had initiated that communication, under normal circumstances, he would get a, a system message back saying that he was not authorized to send to me. So pretty much the WinLink system blocks outside emails. Now, since I have already sent him an email, Larry gets to be on my whitelist kind of automatically, so he can just reply. There is a workaround for how an outside email address can send to WinLink, but I tend to not advertise that because um, I appreciate not getting spam on my WinLink account. <laughs> with 900 plus with 900 plus messages a month, I don't need spam to add to it. Uh, John, I've got a question. Go uh, ahead. Uh, Greg, fine, fine business there. Nice presentation and thank you very much. Uh, Go back a little bit uh, because we do have Dennis here, uh, W4R, uh, WR4I. He is uh, par excellence. He is one of our fantastic CW operators. Uh, can you tell us a little bit how you would do CW related to this WinLink? Uh, maybe expand on that just a bit. He's very no, shy. <laughs> He's very <Okay>. shy. <laughs> he wouldn't ask this question. I have to ask it. Oh, I'll say. Well, you and I can make up for his shyness, I'm sure. Oh, yes. Um, so we wouldn't actually do any CW with WinLink. Um, I, I, I brought up CW as one of the many modes available to us to facilitate emergency communication. Right. And so there may, be, there may be times when the band conditions are so awful that WinLink is not going to succeed. Whereas CW with its, you know, strictly on off can still get through the mess. 
And so that's why I think that CW is far from dead. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Greg, we've got a, got a message here from somebody. I don't think you know him very well. Uh, K4D&D, Dave Damon. Uh, uh, name, name sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Greg. And uh, so um, just a, a little addendum on Greg's comment about encryption versus non-encryption. Where WinLink is not encrypted, it is compressed. So you you don't see you don't see plain text on your screen, and uh, so so maybe maybe that helps out a little bit. Um, and my apologies for getting in there late. You it may have been mentioned already, but <clears throat> if anybody's interested in in having more detail than Greg pre presented tonight, uh, go to the WinLink Wednesday. Uh, website and um, what, what's it called training video uh, Greg is, I can... has an excellent uh, presentation on winlink best practices and 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 the the operative word is best practices so he put a lot of time and effort into that and that's very much worth um, uh, t taking a look at you'll you'll learn an awful lot from uh, from from his his uh, video presentation. So, Greg, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, this is the website winlinkwednesday.net. Most of this stuff up here in the top portion of the screen is is dealing with the current week's net, but there's also some resource documents. If you want to know more, you can learn a little bit here. This is just a five-page PDF that you can download. Uh, these are the training videos. I guess that's a misnomer because there's only one video up, as I as I recall. Um, we had uh, back in July we had um, a Zoom meeting across the state with about 50 attendees, where I just gave some WinLink Wednesday best practices. Uh, after doing this for four years, I've I've seen the good, bad, and the ugly, and we're trying to consolidate the good and uh, keep everybody uh, improving their skills. And so there's lots of others. Uh, the map that I showed you a few slides ago was this participant map. This one gets updated weekly. This is the report that I put out on Thursdays that notes the, you know, some observations about the net and how things went, some summary uh, statistics, and then a complete roster of everybody who participated. We have a thing called the WinLink Wednesday Century Club. Um, and I issue a, uh, a printed certificate to everyone who checks in for 100 weeks. And we have uh, quite a number of folks on that roster already. Um, in fact, the Pentagon Amateur Radio Club is the most recent addition. One of the, one of my Winlink ones others works at the Pentagon. He operates the uh, radio station there. And so he's been faithful about checking in. So he is Winlink Wednesday Century Club certificate holder number 061. So you can read more about that. Um, again, just take a look at, at uh, some of these opportunities. I've gotten to where I, uh, a little while ago, I started writing a blog, just my observations about WinLink, some good, some bad. I've got a, a, a recent uh, thing that didn't go very well that's gonna, I'm thinking to be the subject of my next, of my next blog entry. So that page always has the up-to-date information. The reminder for tomorrow's net is already posted here. Some news updates here. And when I'm on the air, that's the difficulty with WinLink is, unlike something like um, uh, PSK or Olivia, it's hard to just look on a waterfall and see where my signal is. And we had some severe interference recently. So I've added this little element to the, to the website to where when I start the peer-to-peer -peer session, I will actually post here what frequency I'm on, and if it has to change, then I'll, I'll update it there. So that's that. I'll stop my share here, and if there's any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yep, we, we've got uh, 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 Benjamin Kidd has got a question for you. Yeah, hi, uh, just a quick question. Is there a, any sort of store and forward capability kind of similar to APRS? Uh, for WinLink, or does that sort of functionality wholly depend on the uh, the internet and the Amazon Web Services system? 
Um, it's a good question. You, uh, a gateway owner can configure his system if need be, say in a, in a real emergency, uh, to where it's nothing but a local um, store and forward. It's in that, in that configuration, it's not actually attached to the WinLink system, um, but that capability exists. It, I would not call it a normal capability. Normally all that storage and forwarding occurs at the common message server, again, needing internet access. And by the way, I do want to thank you for, uh, well, I don't know if it happened. Maybe your children, uh, your cute children were upstaging me during the whole presentation and people were watching them instead. Hey, Greg, if we don't have any more questions, I think we've about hit our time limit. But many thanks. This was awesome. I Hi. learned a lot. Well, feel free to contact me directly if you want more information and you can't find it on my website. And uh, I'm thank you guys for allowing me to present to you tonight. Um, if, if you're interested in, in learning a little bit about how my background led me into this, uh, just go read my bio on QRZ. And again, contact me directly if you, if you want to ask questions. I would ask that you, if you're gonna ask me questions, use my Gmail address and not my WinLink address. So and, thanks again. And also, you know, you and Larry and I exchanged emails earlier today. So you'll, if you can just email me the PDF, you know, in the next few days, I'll post it. So we have about 140 members, many. So it'll be available for them to see offline. Yeah. Uh, and All right. I'll, well, oh, sorry, I was just going to mention there, we do also have, a, have an important chat in there. Uh, for those of you, you may want to open the chat window because uh, uh, Mike uh, McPherson, uh, KQ9P, who runs a lot of the local gateways, has set up, ha has uh, given you some information about the local servers here that are that are available. Back to you, Greg. Sorry. No, I was just going. Thank you. I was just going to mention to Ed. Uh, you, you probably noticed in my Winley or in my presentation, I do not use PowerPoint to put up a lot of words and read them to an audience that's perfectly capable of reading. So hopefully the uh, very brief language on the slides will still allow people to get the gist of it. Yes, this was excellent and they will. Mike McPherson, do okay. you want to say a few words via audio? Yeah, sorry, you caught me off guard. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, sure, I'll say just a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> as, uh, as a couple of folks have said, uh, we do have two uh, local gateways, uh, VHF and UHF uh, gateways in the Central Virginia area that I operate. And uh, Jack KE4LWT runs a VHF gateway uh, up near Rutgersville uh, that is also available for uh, for anybody to use. Uh, <laughs> sadly, uh, the two gateways I run, the one uh, on Observatory Hill at UVA and the one down at Wintergreen are both off the air right now. Uh, the, the Wintergreen gateway is sitting in my basement. Um, uh, I, uh, I got some folks, uh, we did a little bit of stone soup and, uh, and got the uh, money and equipment necessary to do a major capability upgrade on that gateway. So that one, uh, I finished building it today and um, we'll get it installed sometime in the next uh, week and a half, two weeks, and that one will be back on the air. Uh, the one at UVA is off the air because they're doing some construction work uh, outside of the building and we had to uh, pull, remove the cables that connect the station to the antenna. So uh, as soon as that's done, we'll be able to put that one back on the air. Uh, but those are normally up all the time. And, uh, and both of those are uh, configured to automatically fail over to that local store and forward mode that, uh, that Greg mentioned. Uh, if they lose their internet connection, they fail over. Uh, the one at uh, UVA, um, I can actually put an HF uh, rig on and do uh, uh, forwarding over HF if necessary. I don't keep that up all the time though. Go ahead, Greg. Go ahead, Greg. Well, I just wanted to mention, because um, I didn't really focus on HF, but um, if you're set up for, say, doing PSK31, chances are really good you're set up for doing WinLink. 
and you're set up for doing wind link on HF. So as long as Mike's gateways are temporarily out of service, you can still participate actively in WinLink and in WinLink Wednesday uh, by accessing any of the many, many HF gateways around the country and around the world. In fact, one of my favorite ga HF gateways is uh, up near Philadelphia and I use them routinely. So um, it's a robust system and it's ready for you to join in. Right, we have, I'm estimating about 18 members that regularly operate FTA. I'm pretty sure PK31 is somewhat dead mode now. But would your comment apply to FT8 also? Uh, you know, I'm not an FT8 user, so someone else here yeah. is going to have to answer that for us. I, I, I am, and yes. It, it, if you can do FT8, all you need to do is install the WinLink software, and uh, you're, you're ready to start, uh, start doing WinLink as well. Thank you to both. After after John helps you configure it, of course. <laughs> I, I, I want you to know, I put a note in there that said contact K4D&D and KQ9P, oh. and then I and KO8V and KN4LYT. Yeah. <laughs> so. uh, Robert Manko, you raised your hand. Uh, yeah, total newbie question because uh, I have really bad luck with uh, data <laughs> of any mode, any digital mode. Uh, I have horrible luck getting it to work, but stupid question. So how do you, if I'm doing HF to a gateway, how do I know I'm able to reach it? I mean, I, you know, in the TCP IP world, it would be an equivalent of a ping, right? How do you, how do you, how do you know which gateway you're, you're able to reach if you're going HF? Probably a stupid question, probably not even really a question. So what, what's up with that? Uh. Not, not a stupid question. I'm going to share my screen again. I mean, is there like a ping ditty you do? And it goes, oh, okay, I hit it. Good. <laughs> well, the, the true test the is... Bowling ball, so you got to kind of work with me. <laughs> the, the true test is in trying to hit the station. Right. Um, but, there's some help, but there's some help. You can see my wondering and... I'm going to open a session. Can you guys all see that session window? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow, that was quick. Okay. And I click on channel selection. And it, it uses some propagation estimations uh, for the likelihood. So usually, if I've, since I've got it sorted by path quality, it's telling me my highest likelihood is this station here, which is 121 miles from me at a bearing of 30 degrees. Obviously, it's an estimate, so it's not, there's no, you know, no guarantee. It's also a function of my station, my antenna. Uh, my antenna happens to be a full-size G5RV um, that is about 25 feet off the ground, so I'm primarily set up for Envis, but I have to tell you, even with that antenna, I received a peer-to-peer -peer message last week from a guy in Nebraska. Wow. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I was just, you know, my first thought was, you know, how do I know I'm, I'm getting there? So, okay. Yeah. Well, for, for those of you who remember the good old days of the, of the modem, you know, where, where, you know, all the buzzing noises and things like that before you connect to the internet, you're going to feel right at home with one. Oh, <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of that stuff going on. And a lot of times what will happen is, yeah, you'll, you'll send out a, a signal and you'll, you'll see your transmitter going, yep, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Nothing comes back. Time to switch to the next favorite. And I very frequently in operating with stations that might be, you know, 600 kilometers away, uh, sometimes more. Uh, so the thing that's nice is it means that you could clobber all the internet in the state of Virginia, and I can still send email messages to my family. So that, you know, who aren't in Virginia. Uh, and that's always a sort of a nice feature. If you can just get that one little leg out of the area, then all of a sudden all the internet's working for you again. So anyway, that's all right. when, I, when I work, go ahead. Greg, I, I like to get on to a, a couple other, are you just about, well, I guess what I'm probably saying, we got to wrap it up. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'll stay okay. as long as you want me, but I'll shut up. 
Okay, thank you. All right, is there any old or new business 